please. Turn the Word of God to Mark chapter number 2. Appreciate your patience. Uh, what a wonderful... <laughs> Thank you for your blessing, sir. Uh, well, I am looking forward to friend day for our teenagers next Thursday night. And um, as my heart was turned to this passage of Scripture, a very familiar passage, not so much to some of our teenagers next door, but for some of you uh, that I would call senior saints in the Lord, meaning you've been saved for a number of years. And uh, this is a familiar passage, but I believe some principles that we can draw out of it that will be beneficial to us tonight. And I hope that you'll allow the Lord Jesus Christ to speak to your heart and use it as he has it in, in mind. Sometimes I, I believe that we look at certain things and we just sometimes can read through them. But it's an amazing thing that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that the Word of God, we can find something new every time we read it. There's so much there. There's so much depth. And I don't believe we can truly exhaust the Word of God in this finite amount of time that we have called life. And it's once been said that we don't need something new, but we need something fresh. And the principles and the truths of the Word of God remain the same. Sometimes we just need to be reminded of them. And Mark chapter number 2, we're going to look at this account. And the, the subject, the thought tonight is going to be of reaching the broken. Reaching the broken. If we look around our world today, you'll find many people that are in a sense, for lack of a better term, they're broken. Oh, that doesn't mean that there's something necessarily majorly wrong with them that you can't come back from. And I don't mean that in a sense of a derogatory sense or definition. But in the, in the way that, you know, I was telling the teenagers that in light of their life and where they at, are at in their life that so many people like to put on this mask or this per perception of that they have everything together, that they have kind of got it all figured out. And, but really, if you were to dive below the surface, you would find that there's some insecurity, there's some struggles, there's some doubts, and that there is just a brokenness. And that the only way that we can be whole is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that there are many people that are looking to fill certain voids in their life with a substance with a human relationship, with some type of successful aspect in their job or in their career. But really the only void that fills that God-shaped void is a relationship with Christ. And I don't know where you live specifically, some of you. I've been to your homes and I look back and I see Brother Tony and uh, I think Miss Lisa, boy, she is a tremendous cook. So many of you ladies in here are, but uh, wow, that I've I've longed to have that chicken again there, Brother Tony. I went to their house and she made this chicken that was, uh, I believe it was kind of like basted or wrapped around in uh, was it corn flakes? And my goodness, Brother Walter, that was amazing. I, I guess I'm maybe a little hungry, maybe why it comes to my mind. <sighs> But some of us live in Orange City, some of us live in Deland, some of us live in Deltona, or most of you probably in Deltona, some in DeBerry, some maybe in further outskirts of this region. But for each one of us, we come into contact with individuals. Maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a co-worker, maybe it's someone that we just run into at the cash register or in the store, in the grocery store. But for each one of us, God brings our paths across with people that I believe are divine appointments. It may seem very much like part of the schedule. It may seem like it is something that is routine. But may I say that what we sometimes view as routine is divine providence. And so we must begin to look out beyond ourselves, beyond our schedule. And I'm so encouraged by what God did here on April the 1st of Easter this year, aren't you? I'm so thankful for what He did. And that is the proper statement for what He did and what we got in on. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. And I'm so thankful to see um, different people here that were here on Sunday. I'm so 
thrilled to see the Meffords here tonight. And God bless Eugene and Natalie and little Lila. And I'm so thrilled that we've gotten to get to know them a little bit. And what a, what a blessing that is. But getting to meet, getting to interact with different people. And there are different people that you will come into contact with that really fit this Profile, And may I say and widen it just a little bit, that every single one of us, if you look at us just at, at face value or maybe as God looks at us, every single one of us are broken in some way or another. It was once said that every one of us are weird just in our own way. <laughs> and I believe that I fit that bill very well. But the Lord Jesus Christ here in... Mark chapter number 2, starting in verse number 1, it says, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was no noised that he was in the house. Now Capernaum, or as some would say, Kepharnehum, as uh, some of the guys over there or the tour guides in Israel would say, that this place was really kind of, in a sense, the second home of Jesus. He did so many things there. He was there. And in verse number 1, it says, what? And again he came. He entered into Capernaum after some days. And then this statement that I find very interesting at the end of verse number 1. Look at it with me, if you will. It says, and it was noised that he was in the house. And I, we're going to get the message in just a second. But I, I find interesting words that really jump out at me in Scripture as I'm reading, as I'm studying. And there's a great point here that you could leave a whole other message on. But... That is, when Jesus Christ is in the house, when he's in the location, when he's in the place, it's attractive to people. Why? Because there's something special. There's something unique. There's something powerful. There's something needed. There's something gravitating when the Lord Jesus Christ is present. And that's why it's so vital. That's why it's so important that us as Sunday school teachers, I'm one of them, those of us that have any involvement with people, which is all of us, okay, that we come filled with the Holy Spirit of God, that we ask for the filling of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit in this place, that he would have his way. Because when the Lord is in this place, it's attractive. And it's not about getting people in the doors, but it's about getting people to Jesus Christ. And it was noise that he was in the house. But in verse number 2 it says, And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. Um, interesting choice of words there. And he preached the word unto them. Some come into this place and they wonder why we structure our service a certain way. Well, this word preach in Scripture that we find gives the connotation or the thought of to cry aloud, to declare, to herald. It's not to sit down and have a discussion, although there's time for that. But it's about preaching, heralding the Word of God. Verse number 3, And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was... And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, <laughs> like usual. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee? Or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Father, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would use me, that you would speak through me tonight, that I wouldn't be a hindrance, but I would simply be a vessel. 
God, would you help us tonight to dial in on what you would have for us? Would you help us to put aside our schedules? Would you help us to put aside our issues tonight? And that we would meet, that we would hear, that we would be stirred, that we would be changed by you tonight. In Jesus' precious and holy name, I ask these things. Amen. I want you to see number one tonight, the crippled problem. This gentleman, he had an issue. He had a disease. He had a problem. And this gentleman is very much synonymous with us tonight. You and I come into contact with people every day, multiple times a day, that have an issue, that have a disease, that have a problem, and that is the disease, that is the problem of sin. And this is a problem that is much greater than this gentleman that was sick of the palsy had. Although this was a very difficult situation, I don't mean to minimize it in any way, but it compares in no way to the problem of sin. Why? Because this caused some, in, some struggles, this caused some discomfort, this caused some, some real struggles in his life, but the deficiency, the, the disease, the problem of sin is something that is eternal separation from God forever and ever in a place called hell. The ramifications, the consequences are far greater, my friend. And though we look at this guy and though we may have a friend that if we were in this same similar situation that we'd say, I got to get you to Jesus because we could see an external problem. And so many times we focus on the external. Yes, he had an external problem. There was something far greater on the inside that he had need of. You know, here we have many people that will come by and they will share, hey, I, I have a need. Um, and it most often time has to do with um, finances. And I'm so thankful that we have a church that's willing to reach out and help. And I was able to go help a, uh, one of our teenagers. Her, her family was going through a very difficult time with her father not being able to work. And we're, we were able to go get some groceries for them. And uh, we were able to show up at the house. You should have seen the mother's eyes as uh, we weren't simply handing them money or a check or something that they could go use for something that they shouldn't, but we were able to show up with some food to help that little two-year-old boy and help this teenage girl and this mother and this father and to see how we were able to share the love of Christ. That's a wonderful thing. But the external is not the, the end of the road. It's not something that we are just looking to wholly fulfill. We're looking that when we have a missionary, we're looking to help and satisfy the food, the physical needs, but it's a means to an end. We want to help that. When the macros go overseas and they go to Africa, they take food, they take provisions, and that's a wonderful thing, but they do it and they bring what is most important in addition to that, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what this guy, he had a physical problem. He had something that was there that was crippling him. But my friend, Though you may not see it on the outside, there's a far deadlier, there's a far more debilitating disease, and that is the disease of sin. This one was incurable. They didn't have a way to fix this. He couldn't take it to the doctor. He couldn't go through physical therapy and fix this situation. And we run across people every single day that they have something that they cannot fix. They have something that they can't go and go and they can get healed of by a preacher, by a pastor. They can't go to some particular church and have some type of band-aid put on it to make it maybe go away for a period of time. They can't go and give some money to do something to fix and wash it away. It can only be fixed. It can only be washed. It can only be cleansed and cleared by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This guy had an incurable disease, and he had an inability to help himself. This guy could not get to Jesus. You see, this guy very well had maybe heard who this guy Jesus of Nazareth was, this rabbi, this wonderful teacher, but he couldn't get there. He needed some help, and my friend, we have people all around us that they need someone to bring them to to maybe help lift them, give a little help, maybe not physically, but encouragement-wise, to get them to Jesus. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 22 says, And almost all things are purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. He had an inability to figure this out. 
Now, as it's been well said about AIDS, cancer, and other, that if we had the cure and we just held it, wouldn't that be so selfish? But how many times? And again, I prefaced all of this by talking about the elementariness of this, the simplisticness of this. But sometimes the most simple things are yet the most difficult things. Let me illustrate. We understand that come January, we have to make a resolution for some of us to do what? To get rid of some extra baggage on our front or somewhere else, okay? And we, we have a resolution. But here's the amazing thing. I mean, think with me just for a second here, okay? We're just trying to bring it down here. Mathematics are sometimes difficult, but when it comes to this, it's not very difficult, is it, Brother Wade? You work in a pharmacy, don't you? You're a pretty smart guy. It stands to reason that if the body burns energy, it burns what we put in. But if we take in more than we burn up, then what happens? We gain weight. We store it up for later when we really need it, okay? When we go through the time of fasting. We know what the solution is. We know what the problem is. It's very simple, is it not? I know what the solution to fix some of this is. <laughs> Amen. Amen, yes. Make a witness. But what is the problem? I fail to put it into practice. And my friend, sometimes... What's so simplistic, we fail to put into practice. But I'm here to share again, to bring to the forefront of our mind that we must enact, that we must put into practice that which is so simplistic, but the ramifications that the rings of effect are monumental. I was sharing with somebody recently that one time I was going to Walmart and I pulled in and I, I don't remember if I was going personally for the church but this was a couple years ago I pulled I was driving around and you know what you do when you pull in the parking lot you pull in and what do you do you know you're gonna walk inside for 45 minutes to an hour but you get irate if you can't get those first five parking spaces in the front why because you don't want to walk far to get in the door. But we fail to lose sight of the fact that we're going to walk the whole time we're inside the store, don't we? I used to do some parking for an arts and crafts fair, and people would get so upset that they couldn't go up to the very front. And with, by the way, they'd get really angry, and almost at the point of cussing us out, you know. And, and I started to say one time, you do realize you're going to walk inside for like six hours, right? What's another 200 feet matter, you know? I was pulling in, and I was doing my usual of trying to figure out where I'm going to park. Well, I happened to see this individual that got out, and, um, and I, don't, I don't mean to be uh, rude or mean or anything, but uh, they, they struggled with some things, and, and it greatly affected my opinion and my position of what I was going to try to do there, Brother Herb. And I looked, and I immediately turned around the aisle in my car, and I went to the furthest parking spot I could. And I parked, and I walked all the way in, and I power walked. <laughs> what I saw had affected my position, my perception. And brother and sister in Christ... We must allow what we see around us to, to affect our position and our perception. We must be willing to, like these four guys, be compassionate. These four guys were compassionate, friends. If you look here in verse number 4, we'll start in verse number 3. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four, and when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. These guys were compassionate. They didn't simply stop short of saying, 
He has a problem. He has a need, and his need is Jesus. That's wonderful. Some of us have really got to let that ring and resonate in our head. We've got to get to that first stage, and I commend them for that. But they didn't simply stop there. They had compassion on the guy. I'm reminded of Jude 22 and verse 23, and it says this, And if some have compassion, get this, making a difference. And it kind of denotes there that if you want to make a difference, you must have compassion. And if some have compassion, making a difference, that if you have compassion, you're going to make a difference. And so these guys, they recognize the situation. They assess the situation. But they didn't stop short there. They took it from there, and they understood the ability of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I, I believe sometimes we a little bit underestimate the ability of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, no, no, I don't. Well, let me prove it to you. These guys, they no doubt had heard who Jesus Christ was. You say, okay, yes. I believe that they did. Because this guy Jesus, it was, it was just going like wildfire all over the countryside of Judea, Jerusalem, all, all this area. And so they knew who this guy was, and they believed so much in his ability that they not only said, hey, you need to try to get to Jesus. What did they do? They found a way to get him to Jesus. Here's what they did. Get this, this is important. They didn't simply identify the problem and share the solution. They went out of their way to get the person with the problem to the person with the solution. They bought into the fact so much that he the Lord Jesus Christ could make a change in their friend's life and maybe their co-worker's life. They believed, they bought into it so much that they went out of their way. Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse 20 says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Romans chapter 4 verses 19 through 22 says this, And being not weak in faith... He considered not his own body now dead. This is speaking of Abraham and getting ready to talk about Sarah. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was, get this, strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded what he had promised, he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. My friend, this guy Abraham, he believed the promise of God. He believed that what he said he would do, that he would follow through and fulfill. And we have to come to the point where we believe that the results are not up to us, but there's a commission, there's a command, there's a directive, and that's our responsibility. And the results are up to him. We say, well, I've invited my neighbor, I've invited my coworker, I invited, Pastor Tim, you don't know what you're talking about. I invited my friend to Journey, I invited my friend, my coworker to Easter two weeks ago. They said no. Keep at it. Continue. Persistence. Don't give up. I'm so thankful the Lord didn't give up on me. Aren't you glad he didn't give up on you? If we were to go around the room tonight and look at how many were saved the very first time they heard the gospel, I believe the numbers would probably be pretty low in here tonight. These guys understood the ability. But here's what I love. They had a determined attitude. In verse number four, it says, And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press. I think we understand what took place here. Many of you could iterate this story far better than I ever could or this account. They looked at the, the need. They identified the need. And they accepted the ability of the healer to fix that problem. And then they moved to going, okay, you need to get to him, and I care enough about you to get him. To, we're going to find a way to get you to Jesus. Okay, well, we get this stretcher, this bed. We're going to get this mat. We're going to take it, and we're going to take you to Jesus. And they get there, and they find that the house is packed. 
They find that they can't get into the house, no way, no how. And if I believe that if maybe these guys were like some of us, that the story, that the account would have ended there. Because, I mean, I, I'm, I'm here, okay? It's me too, all right? That we, all right, we're getting them to Jesus, and we get there, and there's an obstacle. And we go, I tried. <laughs> Better luck next time. <laughs> well, come next Easter. <laughs> and we, we pat ourselves on the back on the back because we tried and I'm not diminishing that I'm not belittling that but what I'm simply saying tonight is these guys they got to the house and they faced an obstacle that they didn't expect what they fully expected was Jesus maybe to be out in the open on the countryside in the middle of the market teaching and they could just get him in there but what they found when they got there to the location was that there was a barrier that there was no way that they could get in the house they, they go to maybe a window. You have people standing inside, outside the window. They can't figure out how to get inside. They, they huddle. Okay, huddle. How are we going to get in here? I don't know. I mean, can we tunnel underneath? Get, maybe we can like bust through the side of the wall. No, there's people on the other side. You can't do that, Jim. And so they, they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. I, I, I can only imagine what the conversation must have been like. And you know, application that I think is a side application is very good. I want you to get this. That when these guys, they had a plan. It was a good plan. It was an ordained plan of God. Something where they were bringing someone to Jesus. And this could be in some other aspect of life. I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to pinpoint for you. But they had this plan and they got there. And they could not get through. And when they could not get through, when their plan would reached a barrier and they couldn't get through, they were forced to begin to look up. And my friend, sometimes what we look as a negative or the end of the road or a barrier or, or a shutdown of all of our efforts is sometimes simply the opportunity, simply the direction for us to stop looking for a way through the situation, but simply to stop and begin to look up. And I believe that if some of us would allow our situation, allow our what has been a, a path or a walk of faith and trying to bring someone else and we don't look at the barrier as the end or just the, oh well, and we would begin to look up, the Holy Spirit may begin to reveal a reason why or another door. And what they begin to think through, and I don't know exactly what the conversation would have been like. We don't have it here, although I wish we did. One day I look forward to hearing this conversation with these guys. But they begin to look up, and they begin to see that there was another option. There was another door. What they thought was an obstacle was simply an opportunity. And my friend, sometimes what you see as an obstacle is truly in the eyes of God, an opportunity. It's an opportunity for you to grow and to be stretched in faith. It's an opportunity for others to see the Lord Jesus Christ active and strong in you. Sometimes it's simply that he wants his son to be magnified through us so that others can see Christ in us and that instance of that, what was an obstacle, but becomes an opportunity, and others see that in you, that they say, it is real with them. Sometimes that's just what's needed. These guys were determined. I love the tenacity, the determination of these guys. 1 Corinthians 2, in verse 2, the Apostle Paul writes and says, For, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ, and him crucified. There's a song that was written some years ago. It's entitled, I Am Determined. And it, it, says some, it goes something like this. It says, I am determined 
to be invincible till he has finished his purpose in me and nothing shall shake me for he'll never forsake me and i am determined to live for the king boy i wish we had that spirit every day i wish i had that spirit every day that i'd be determined to live for the king but these guys were i share this and maybe it'll be of some comfort maybe it'll be of some help to some someone in here my wife's grandfather was for years he was unsaved his name was clark ball or his name is clark ball and clark was on the road he was a trucker this guy clark he was a he was a rough man he was in the navy and he was a drinker strong drinker and he would come home off the road and be home for you know a little bit go to the the place where all of his buddies were and they drink and spend the money and his wife Janet had three kids two kids I'm sorry and uh, Penny and was the daughter and Penny grew up and her daddy never went to church with her mom mom ended up getting saved after Penny started going to church and in a Bible study and Janet made sure that Penny and her brother would um, always make it to church well Penny grew up, she met a man named Jeff, they got married, they got active in their local church, and God directed them to a different ministry, and closer to home, and began serving there, in the area of Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, and serving the Lord, they had four daughters, one of those daughters I married, the oldest Kayla, for years and years, there was prayer for Clark, Clark was one who didn't want to hear anything about the gospel, I'll never forget that at my wedding of Kayla and I's wedding, well, scratch it, it was Kayla's wedding, I was just there, okay. <laughs> Get that right. But at our wedding, he was, he was there, and that was a shock to everybody, for the Bob, that he would even come. They tried to get him to come for Christmas programs, things like that, he didn't really ever come. He came maybe a handful out of 18 years of my wife's life to a church event. And they were shocked that he came there been praying for years and years. Janet would continually request prayer. We'd get together for Thanksgiving, and Clark wouldn't come because he knew the Christian influence of what would be there at Thanksgiving time of giving thanks to the Lord of prayer, and he didn't want any part of that. But we continued to pray. Well, just a couple years into our marriage, uh, Janet was diagnosed with cancer, and uh, there was a battle for a few years, and she ended up passing away, dying. And at the funeral, Clark was there, and there was a real softening in his face, in his temperament. And just a short time later, we got word that at his house, he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. Sometimes we look at a family member, we look at a coworker, we look at someone else, and we say, what good is it doing? But may I say that determination, tenacity, persistence is what's needed. Sometimes we get grow weary because we go, I see no effect to the seed that I'm sowing. But may I remind you that we sow, some have watered, but God gives the increase. And years and years later, now, Clark, I love to sit, and they call him Pop-Off Clark. I love to sit and talk to Pop-Off Clark because I know the type of man, I know the testimony that was there. And to sit from him and a man who was a pretty vile, racial, just disdaining man is now sits across from him as a man who, who's been in church very little in these past couple of years. But my, to see the growth 
and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ shining through in his life is so encouraging. It's just so vibrant. He'll talk about what he read and how God's convicting him about certain things in his life and seeing that spark in his life. It's just so encouraging. But I, I, but I never stop to remember what it must have been like 20, 30 years ago for Janet and for Penny and for Raymond, her brother, to go, it's Christmas. Wish Dad would go to church with us tonight. But continual prayer, determination, and saying, God, I'm going to do my part, and I've just got to trust that you're willing and that you will do what you say you do and do your part. But there was a complete miracle that took place. Look here with verse number 5, and we're done. When Jesus saw their faith. (laughs) I love that part. When he saw their faith. When he saw the faith of those guys, that they would stop at nothing to get their friend to, to him. He had to have just welled up with a sense of happiness. He was pleased. He saw the faith of those guys, and I believe probably some faith in that guy who was there. Because he didn't go kicking and screaming, as we can tell. That when he saw their faith, he looked to this guy who was dropped down in front of him in the house. And he says, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. He forgave his sin. All of the work, all of the effort that was here... Back here where they were trying to figure out, well, I wonder how we can convince him that it's a good idea to get to Jesus. I don't know what we have to do. I mean, he he can't get there on his own. We've got to help him. We've got to find a way to get him there. They look back at this, and they're at top of the roof, and they look down, and Jesus looks up at them, and he looks down at him, and he says, "Your your sins are forgiven you. But when he forgave him of his sins, doesn't go without the scribes' reaction. What took place with those scribes? <laughs> those guys, immediately after he said that, they began going in their mind. Well, who is this guy? Who does he think that he is to forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. Well, on that statement, they were right. Because Jesus, as he said... In John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In John 1, 1, we find out that in the beginning, God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we go through there and we find that it validates that Jesus Christ was God. That he was the one who could forgive sins. He forgave his sin, but he also fixed his his problem. This guy who once was there, who could not get up. This man who was in bondage, if you will, by this sickness, who was held hostage by this disease, was now set free. And may I say, friend, that this disease that once held us hostage no longer holds power over us that the sin that once held us bound now has no power, now can have no victory over us unless we allow it to. Romans chapter 6 and verse 17 and 18 says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. In verse number 11, Jesus says unto this guy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all. In verse number 11, Jesus looks at this guy. And he was telling him this. He said, What you came in on, you're going out with. What held him on the way in, he was going to be holding on. And my friend, once we were held captive, once we were held in bondage by sin, but through the redeeming power of the Lord Jesus Christ, we now have freedom. So not only 
that he forgive us for his sin and fix his promise. But ultimately, these guys had their faith rewarded. 1 Corinthians 9.25 says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Hebrews 11.6, we know the hall of faith passage, but in verse number 6 it says, But without faith, it's what? Impossible to please him. For he that cometh to him must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that dil diligently seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. You say, we just came off of Easter, Pastor Tim. You kind of, I think you got the calendar mixed up. No, I, I got it quite right. I understand where we're at. You know, this is an awesome church. And I love the spirit of what God is doing in this place. Everything we said on that video Easter Sunday morning is 100% true. That God is working at Volusia County Baptist Church. He is. You know, uh, I, won't, I won't share that. But uh, somehow God muzzles you for the right reason. God's doing something here. I was sharing with my wife recently. I said, you know, I really believe that we're on the cusp of God doing something absolutely miraculous. I really, really do. And I don't say it because I'm standing on the platform. I've said it privately in the privacy of my own home to my wife. You know, it's going to be miraculous, not because of what we can do, but because of what God does through us if we're yielded and willing for him to do it. This guy was brought to Jesus, the one who could heal him, the one who could forgive him, the one who could do the miraculous because of the faith, because of the determination of these four guys. And where do we fit? We're those four guys. We've been healed. We've been set free. We've been empowered. But we've got to be willing to not just identify the problem and buy in or believe the solution we've got to be willing to be determined to get those with the problem to the one who's the healer so maybe you had someone like I did for Easter had a few in fact and invite them to come to Easter well they didn't come but that can be a little bit of a downer can it but you know what Maybe you need to go back this week. Maybe you need to. Maybe you don't have the pen that says "Soldier of Cross," but maybe you need to enlist yourself. Say, "I'll be a soldier of the cross." I'm gonna go back to that neighbor. I'm gonna go back to that coworker. I'm gonna go back to that family member, and say, "I'm here again." <laughs> I know I've been here five times, but I'm here again. And you wonder why? It's because I love you. Because you need something that God has for you. So will you be determined tonight? There are people all around us that are broken. People all around that need the God-shaped void filled by the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I do ask that you would help us to realize that, as Brother Jim has said, you want us, that we are to be called a soldier, but that we are to be that private in the Lord's army. Father, would you help us tonight to determine that we will live, that we will stand, that we, we will reach out for the King. Lord, would you help each one of us tonight that has someone that maybe we've invited in the past, maybe even as recent as last week, that we'd give them a call, we'd shoot them a text message, we'd send them a Facebook or social media request, we'd go by their house and we'd just say, hey, why don't you come back and hear about the power of the gospel again this week. Lord, help us to be like these four guys. Help us to be determined. Help us to be faith-filled and live out that faith that we have. As the piano begins to play, I don't know how God spoke to your heart tonight. But boy, as I said, it's so simplistic, but sometimes the most simplistic things, until we begin to put them into practice, 
have no bearing. They have no power. So we're going to stand in just a moment. May the Lord spoke to your heart tonight as he has mine. Maybe you need to bow the knee there at your seat. Maybe you need to sit down at your seat there. Maybe you need to come forward to the altar and say, God, would you put a passion, ignite something within my heart. Oh, yes, we've heard it 500 times, but have we done it 500 times in the past year? So simplistic, so simple, so elementary, but so profound. So we're going to stand in just a second. And when we do, I invite you to do business with God. No doubt the Holy Spirit's put someone on your heart. No doubt He has put someone's face in your mind's eye. What are you going to do as we stand? For the less as you sing. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thing, but getting the people to Jesus is not simply a Christmas and Easter thing. It's an everyday thing. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, you did and still. Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, and I thank you for the wonderful example of these four guys that I can learn from in so many ways. Father, would you burn within my heart, within our hearts, a desire, a passion for the lost. We don't simply want to play church, but Father, help us to be the church. Help us to be the body. Help us to be the extension of of the Lord Jesus Christ and do what you've put us here for and that is to be a bringer. Help us to proclaim Christ to those that we come into contact with. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen.